He served as executive director of Drayton Hall, a historic site owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Charleston, South Carolina. In 2016, he retired and became its executive director emeritus. A native of Atlanta, he earned a BA in history from Sewanee, a master's of arts in teaching history from Brown University, and a PhD in American history from Duke University. Maryland served as his training ground, for it was his work in Maryland while a graduate student at Duke and led him to choose history museums as a career path. In 1974, a graduate internship at St. Mary's City opened his eyes to teaching with historic sites. Thanks to support from John Pierce, Nancy Miller Shamu, oh. Louise Heyman, Mark Edwards, and others at the Maryland Historical Trust, he was hired from 1976 to 1979 as a historic site surveyor in Southern Maryland and in Montgomery County, documenting historical African-American places in ways no other state had done. His inspiring book about African-American history in Southern Maryland, Hearth and Home, Preserving a People's Culture, won an honor award from the National Trust. A log house built in 1874 by an African-American landowning family from Montgomery County, and he documented in 1979, was selected by the National Museum of African-American History and Culture and has been reassembled and exhibited there as the Freedom House. Since visitors can go inside, it now ranks as the most highly visited African-American home in the nation. This is but one example of his pioneering work, which has earned awards at local, state, and national levels. The good news is that upon retirement, he decided to continue his research and writing in Montgomery County and Southern Maryland, and looks forward to learning even more and giving back. Please welcome George McDaniel. Back in Maryland, I tell you, and that's very true. But what Mark was saying, and you I'll talk about that further in the presentation, but Maryland was very much my training ground. It really was. I had uh, taught in high school um, in, in Atlanta and also in Providence, Rhode Island, and realized things needed to change, that we need to change the way we, we teach American history, not only in content but by methodology to get students engaged in what I call proximate learning, by being next to them, moving outside your bubble and learning from one another. Uh, and so I, I wanted to do that at Duke and, and, uh, uh, and then got a fellowship, I got first an internship in Savior City and learned about material culture, but I didn't know the term existed at the time. It wasn't in 1974, but in Lexington, grad schools. Um, and also teaching with historic, through, through historic preservation, historic sites. It wasn't was what one did with PhD. One, one, one taught in classrooms. And it was my experience in St. Mary's City and in the Maryland Star of Trust that opened this entire career of historic preservation teaching with sites. So I'm delighted to be back in Maryland and uh, 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 live in Somerville, South Carolina, and will continue to live there. But I want to find ways to to, to build on the work that I did in Maryland and, and continue to find ways to, 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 get, to give back. So I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here. And I want to dedicate this uh, presentation tonight to, to my good friend, uh, John Pierce, who was the State Historic Preservation Officer for the Maryland Historical Trust in the 1970s. And he really had a vision for what historic preservation could be and it's when when Louise and Nancy and I were having lunch together, we talk about you know fights. I mean you really have to decide on you know what to do. And John just consistently stood up for historic preservation. And I learned a lot from him. And he supported the work that, which was new at the time. But he supported the work that I was envisioning to improve the teaching of history. And I also want to thank Louise Heyman 
and Nancy Smooth for their wonderful support when I was at the Maryland Historic Trust. Uh, it was meant, meant a lot to me personally, and, and it still does. So this is this, but this main person was was was, uh, was, uh, was John Pierce, um, and uh, so I want to introduce. Still living in, in Fredericksburg, but it's not in good health. Uh, so I want to dedicate this to him. And he and I were good friends. <laughs> he was, a, a, he was a, as I said there, he was a strength in times of need. And so uh, I want to dedicate this uh, to, to, uh, to John. And since I'm <coughs> from Georgia, and, and Maryland is, is so much a part of the, well, the South is so much a land of storytellers, and Maryland's in, in a lot part of that. I sort of want to begin with a story. And it's a story told by a uh, cousin by marriage, Farrell Sams. Some of you may have read his book, Grumman Horseman, Whisper the Reverend, and other things, but this is his book of passing perspectives on rural America. And it's a story about his going back to his uh, little community just south of Jonesboro, where our mm -hmm. families lived, um, south, south of Atlanta, and going back to Methodist Church. And things have changed, and that's what his, his book was about. And he talked about that things have changed because when he went to that church, Truman went there and it would be seen but not heard. So they were hiring a new minister and they invited this young graduate from Methodist Seminary to come give a sermon uh, and, and test it out. So to you know, show his qualifications, he thought, I'm going to invite all the young people down in front of the sanctuary uh, to show them, you know, I can fellowship and share and do all that. So he had all the young children down in front of him. And he asked the young children, he said, boys and girls, I'm going to tell you a story about a creature that lives in the woods and runs up and down trees. What do you think that is? They just sat there and looked at it. <laughs> they got a little nervous. And he said, all right, boys and girls, I'm going to tell you a story about a creature that lives in the woods and runs up and down trees and has sharp teeth. What do you think that is? Looked at it. He got really nervous this time. <laughs> His job was put on the line. He said, all right, boys and girls, I'm going to tell you a story about a creature that lives in the woods, runs up and down trees, has sharp teeth, has a bushy tail. What do you think it is? <laughs> At which point, a little four-year-old girl raised her hand and said, I know we're supposed to say Jesus, but it sounds like a <laughs> So I say that because so often that's the way history is told. I know we're supposed to say so-and-so. We memorize so-and-so and so-and-so, but we need to open history up. We need to open it up. And that's what, I, that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I think that's what the Maryland Historical Society is really pushing to try to do, is to open up history, to engage people in this conversation, in this dialogue about what constitutes history, what's important, and whose perspective counts. And not in terms of a hierarchy, but how can we get people together so we can have a, a safe, civil conversation about the past rather than shouting at one another. How can we open up history uh, in civil and, and respectful ways? So and we'll talk about that. And I think history offers us so much opportunity for, for understanding one another. And that's one of the things in my presentation. And I'm going to talk about opening up history and that, that history is a product of the choices we make. We don't know what the future is going to ask. We don't, we don't know what going to happen with climate change. Fifty years from now, people may say, well, why do you do so and so and so and so? Well, we'll have reasons for why we didn't. Well, we don't know what's going to happen with North Korea. People in the past uh, didn't know as well. So we need to, we need to look at things from, from, from different perspectives and appreciate uh, their point of view. And the second point, of view, second point is that historic preservation is not so much about the past, but about the future. What kind of future do we want? And that was what John Pierce said again and again. What kind of future do we want for the past? So I'm speaking the words of John Pierce when I, when I say that. And I'm 
talk about the, the, the Maryland Historical Trust. It was a, well, Maryland was a training ground um, for me. Um, and I learned so much of, from my experiences here uh, in, in, in Maryland. And I began work here in, in, as an intern for the Smithsonian in St. Mary's City in 1974. Uh, and then had the fellowship of the Smithsonian. Did research as a historic site survey in Southern Maryland and later in uh, Montgomery County. And that research in, in Southern Maryland was the subject of my dissertation. Um, and I learned here in Maryland, in Maryland, about how we can use historic sites to make history tangible, how we can connect past, present, future through historic sites, how we can use history to build bridges, people of different backgrounds and cultures and how we can see history from multiple points of view, not just from one point of, of view. So I learned that here, and the result of that was my dissertation, and then my book uh, came out, and there was uh, that won an honor award from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and thanks a lot to Louise Heyman uh, for nominating that, and it's one of the few books that's won an honor award um, from the National Trust. And that book was about history and from multiple points of view. But I learned here in, in, in Maryland, and I learned about slave houses. I've never seen the slave house in Sodomy. But I did just learn about the building itself. I learned about how one-room cabins were lived in. And there in front was, was James Scrabble, born in 1878, when I interviewed him and lived in Sodomy. Not in that house, but houses like that. And I learned from him how life was organized in those one-room houses. And then to the next is McKinley Gant in Calvert County near Prince Frederick, standing in front of the late 18th century, early 19th century house owned by his father, who had been a slave, who in freedom went during when the Civil War broke out with permission of his owner, joined Union Army, after the Civil War, used his mustering out pay to work as a waterman. He also worked in waterman, as here in Baltimore, saved enough money to buy that plantation house. And there you see the Kenley again with a photograph of his mother, who was born during slavery. So those are the resources that are out there in Maryland. And I was trying to document in the 1970s. And the Ken again also has photographed his father and other things pertinent to, the, to, uh, to, his, to his family's history. And then through it all, John Pierce was just such a, such a mentor to me. And here we are with William Diggs in, uh, in, in Charles County. Uh, and he was supporting not just my, my uh, appreciation of architecture, and that, that people did that, but I was more interested in how we can use the study of these houses, these places, to teach history. And John put that vision uh, and supported me in that. And then from uh, my experience in Maryland, I went on to work with other historic sites and so forth and other museums, and then took the job as executive director of Drake Hall from 1970, 1989 to 2015, uh, just from which I've, I've, I've retired. And that's what I want to talk about now, is some of my work uh, at Drake Hall. So here's that historic home, um, which was acquired by the National Trust in 1974, one of the most remarkable historic sites uh, in America. And the mission was very simple, but it took us a long time to get there. And then it's our mission was, we could say it in one sentence, you put on the back of a business card. It was to preserve and interpret Drake Hall and its environments in order to do two things, educate the public, and to inspire people to embrace historic preservation. And I think both education and historic preservation are two sides of the same coin. And that's what we need to do more of in all of our work. So Drake Hall was established in 1738. Uh, John Drake, who was born next door at Magnolia uh, Plantation, is still uh, uh, in possession of descendants of the Drake family. Um, in the 1738, this was George, George Washington was six years old. And it's uh, located on the Ashley River, which you see here, this is the Ashley River, 
This is the Kupa River, and this is the Charleston Peninsula here. And for those of you who've been to Charleston, you may have heard that the that the Ashton and the Kupa River come together here in Charleston Harbor to form the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> Just to let you know, here is Great Hall, or the headwaters of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> So it's the oldest, Great Hall is the oldest unrestored plantation house in America. And that is, it, it hasn't been taken back to the 18th century and so forth. Um, and it's, uh, it, 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 it's, 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 it's uh, remarkable in what it can offer to the, uh, to, to, to the nation as a result of its not having been restored to a particular period. And what it, it offers, it's a, it's a masterpiece of colonial uh, architecture. Um, it, if you were to draw a line right to the center of it, you said one half uh, evenly balances uh, with, with, one, with one another. It's hard to read, try to read my limbs. Can you hear me? I'll step over here so I can see my slides a little easier here. One of the things that is so important, I think, about teaching with historic sites is, is that especially in the South, but also in Maryland, is that they're places of beauty, to be sure, but they're also juxtaposed against the tragedy of slavery. That creative tension drives a powerful story that resonates still today. So it's not just a way back yonder kind of story. It's also something we're still living with the legacy of slavery, race relations today. So these historic sites have resonance today. It's not just politically correct, but it's good history. And that's the best message that we can, we can convey through historic sites. What sites on site with Drayton Hall also represents is the sophisticated taste of the, of, of the planner elite, how well educated they were, and how, they, how connected they were to the Atlantic world of the 18th century. And this is illustrated by comparing Drake Hall on the right with Villa Carnar on the left, which is from the Veneto, designed by Pla uh, Andrea Palladio in the, eight, in the 15, uh, 1560s. Uh, and it appears in his full books of architecture, uh, published in, eight, in 1570. And John Drake had a copy, an English translation of that from the early 18th century. And there you can see the resemblance between the two. There had been no house, no building in America produced earlier uh, than this uh, that has a two-story portico. This is directly from the drawings of uh, Palladio. But oh, let me just back up. But also notice how it's Georgia, and that John Drake, the builder, the owner wasn't just a copy. Notice the illustration on the first floor and second floor. And notice here. So that's Georgian. So this is called Palladian and Georgian, both. And notice also the, the portico here, it just processes. Here, portico processes. It also recesses. So John Drake was, was innovative. He wasn't just a copyist, he was, he was a creator. Here we see uh, Drake and Hall as it appeared in a waterfall of 1765. When I came to Drake and Hall, we, I was sort of the current interpretation was that the river was the main traffic of, 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 of commerce and human transportation. And as a result of documentary research, we found it wasn't the case. Uh, when people went to Charleston, they went by land, not by water, because of the Ashford of uh, narrow and tidal. Uh, and this was the principal facade. And notice the landscape. Notice how sheltered it is, uh, we have the colonnade and also the palisade here. But notice those trees. Looks sort of like a bad haircut. <laughs> that was fashionable in the mid-18th century. The Baroque had gone out of style. <clears throat> so this, this naturalistic landscape was what was fashionable in the 18th century, mid-18th century, just as was this uh, style of architecture um, that we see. And here we see that five-part Palladian design, main block, 
here with the two colonnades, the two plank buildings. Here we see Homewood, same kind of five part, pl uh, five part plan, except the pythons here joining the flank buildings that, uh, that uh, Plotio favored uh, in, his, in, his, in his architecture. And here we see detail, uh, by details count. If you look at these outbuildings, they are tanned in five degrees. So as you approach, the house runs about a half mile of an entrance drive here, shown here to the main house. Because they are slanted outward, we know this by archaeological excavations, then we see this as, as perpendicular to the main house. So even in the, in the macro scale, the designer of this is thinking about, uh, uh, about balance and harmony. Then when we go into the interior, we look at the floor plan and we see how rooms on this side balance rooms on this side. We see how these rooms together form a three by four ratio, which Palladio favored. Also, the entire footprint, which we see here, is a three by four ratio, which Palladio favored. So things have been academically thought through in terms of the floor plan, the interior as well as the exterior. Just a word about John Drayton as a planner. Like Chesapeake Regional Planners, he owned thousands and thousands of acres, uh, not just around Drake Hall. Uh, he owned plantations as far south as the Satilla River which is just above, um, um, above, above Florida. In total, he and his brother uh, own over 76,000 uh, acres. So we need to keep that in mind when we see the wealth that was generated to produce a plantation of like Drake Hall. Here we see uh, Drake Hall's period in, in the 1840s, 1845, thrown by, by the great-grandson of John Brayton. There it is in, 18, in, in, in the 1880s. Fortunately, it was not burned during the Civil War. Other plantations up and down the Ashton River were put to the torch. The Drayton Hall survived. The Draytons were able to recoup a portion uh, of their fortune by way of mining calcium phosphate, which is a marine deposit that was used for fertilizer. Um, it was so important that the Civil War for cotton culture uh, in the South, and they were able to make the necessary repairs and also retain ownership of the site. We have a lot of, um, of 1870 coming to the Drakens asking, uh, to, asking the Drakens to sell the house for bricks uh, to be used in the reconstruction of, of, uh, of Charleston. And then there we see it in 1974, when it was acquired by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And we'll hear in a videotape to follow about the why the decision uh, was made by the Drayton family to part with Drayton Hall after seven to six, eight generations of, of ownership. There we see the, here we see the interior. All the, all the woodwork that you see uh, is original, the mantle and overmantle. This is a copy. Um, from William Kent's designs of Indigo Jones in 1727, again demonstrating how the grapes were part of the Atlantic world. Um, and then this blue paint, uh, bluish gray paint, uh, is of the 1880s from that calcium phosphate mining that I was describing earlier. And also the ceiling uh, is of that period as well. When the Drayton passed, uh, the Drayton Hall II, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, there was a lot of debate about what to do with the house because the Draytons had not added in the 20th century heat, air conditioning, or running water. The owner of the property for much of the 20th century uh, was a spinster, lived in Charleston, had a home in Charleston. They would come in to a place in the country, as they said. Um, and, and she had not added, she had not changed it. And, and uh, when her two nephews inherited the property and passed it to the National Trust, 
There were those who thought, especially those in, some, those in Charles who thought, we need to restore to its 18th century glory. There are those historic houses in Virginia, in New England, that have been restored to the 18th century glory. Why should we have a uh, you know, faded paint of the 1880s? Let's take that off and let's show it in its 18th century glory. And it had furniture and other things. That was the debate went on for a good while, but fortunately, architectural historians, historical preservationists, and others won the day and said, no, leave it alone. Make it unique. Because you have other 18th century representations at Monticello, Mount Vernon, etc. You can see those elsewhere. But you, what you don't see is this timeline of history, not the time capsule. So you see how this house evolved over time. And if you add, if you add furniture, that means you have to add heat and air conditioning systems, which means you work run duct work, which means you put registers in the wall, which means you're cutting through 18th century historical fabric. Leave it alone. So that was the decision um, that was made. And over time, that has proved to be a very wise decision. Here we see the stair hall that's on the riverside uh, of the house, 27 feet in height, one of the grandest stair halls um, of uh, 18th century uh, American houses. Um, and while it is grand in scale, we can also just, oops, I'm sorry, we can just see, look, let's see, there we go, look, back. What are we doing? You don't see the fine woodwork. All this is mahogany, and this was stained vermilion. So there was a reddish hue to it. It's all out the call, uh, all the more. And you can see here, it's got a squash blossom here. And that's also replicated in the woodwork up here, this original. And if we go back here, you can see it in the plaster work here. So again, details count. The, the mind behind this is thinking about balance and symmetry uh, in scale and also in details all the way through the house. The second floor, the second floor of Great Hall, uh, it was the most elegant of the rooms, and we can see that it was the most privileged because of the Corinthian capitals of the pilasters here, the marble firebox, and then also the elegant man, uh, over mantel as well. But what you also see in this, in this room is its board ceiling, not the elegant hand-sculpted <laughs> ceiling that was there historically. After the Civil War, the Drayton Hall, the Drayton family had lost their fortune, but African Americans had gained their freedom. So the Draytons did not have the money to go by and restore the ceiling, so they just went down to the hardware store, if you will, and bought these beaded boards. <laughs> so there you see this contrast in the, in the rise and fall of white plantation society and also the rise of after emancipation of African Americans. So that one story tells these overlays of culture if you look at it from different perspectives. Also from the landscape. Landscape two was unrestored. And here you see that the entrance I laid that as you saw in the water column came directly up to the main house. In the Victorian period, thanks to the mining of calcium phosphate, the dragons added this mound, this Siri mound, mound that you see, with a, uh, a uh, sundial, had been a sundial in the center with a rose garden. And this mound was made from the spoil, from this curvilinear uh, lake that would not have fit in the 18th century. That's a Victorian effort to soften the landscape. So by leaving the landscape alone, by not restoring it to a particular period, we see how thinking about landscape changed over time. And also you can see where archaeological excavations are going on. Some of the landscape uh, historians that we've talked to have said that the Drake Hall Office is one of the most significant 
landscapes in America uh, because of its archaeological potential. It's, it hasn't been disturbed by shovels in the ground putting in uh, gardens. And there you are. We pay a lot, we, I said we pay, I should use the past tense because I don't work there anymore. Um, we pay a lot of attention to guide training in order to tell this more complete story uh, of Great Paul and, and to connect visitors not only to the history but also to, uh, to Great Paul. And the point being is that these historic sites offer a way of teaching history that a classroom or a book alone can't provide. You experience history. History is tangible, something you can touch. Um, so we, we, we pay a lot of attention to that. And you see the guy here um, using a spoon as a pointer, which we use deliberately because throughout the tour in Drayton Hall, we would say, thanks to the friends of Drayton Hall, we were able to stabilize this ceiling. Thanks to the friends of Great Hall, we were able to conduct this archaeological excavation. Thanks to the friends of Great Hall, we were able to have these educational programs. Then at the end of the tour, the guy would say, if you want to join Great Hall, become a friend of Great Hall and support these programs that you've heard about, we invite you to join and you get this spoon. <laughs> and we had over 6,000 members. 6,000 members, which for that's just general operating support, and as Mark can tell you how precious those dollars are, unrestricted, the general operating support. And then we had some people who came through, in fact, one donor in particular came through, who became a member and then stepped their way on up, and then now it's given $600,000 towards our new business center. So uh, you never know who's going on a tour. So these. Asking people to help and let them know that preservation doesn't just happen. It's thanks to people like you that, that Maryland, Maryland Historical Society exists. That you have exhibits, you have an education program, you have a nice program. That just happened. So people need to know that and be upfront with that as part of your tours. So we we'll just pass that on. We also build bridges and, and start sites and a lot of work on and things I'm talking about. Not just Drake Hall, all the sites are doing it too. Many sites, including this organization. Good work in, in, in school programs. We had over 8,000 kids a year coming. We won awards for our programs in, 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 in education that was standards based. There's something that I was especially concerned about is historical illiteracy. And that's such a, I think, Mark and I were talking about it over lunch. The, 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 there's a lot of controversy about monuments and Confederate monuments and so forth. But the, we can remain in our entrenched positions. But the main battle is over history education. That's the main battle. That's the main battle. That's the war. That's the war. And I just saw a television a while ago an interview with governors of South Carolina, six governors on, and it wasn't until 15 minutes after the interview that somebody mentioned the humanities. It was all about jobs, 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 workforce preparedness, and everything. That's important. 